We're just going to begin, and if people come, they do. If they don't, they don't. And we're recording, so other people can just take it. So, we're going to be talking about the Talmud today. And what 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 do you what do you all know about the Talmud? How would you how do you describe what you've heard or anything? There's no right or wrong answer, but just maybe a few words. Anything that comes to mind with the word Talmud? Again, no right or wrong. Yochanan. I think the most important thing to know about it is that it's not a law code as much as it's a collection of different opinions about what the law, what Jewish law is on what matters. Nice. Right. It's it's a conversation, and the Talmud, the Talmud is is not like a, a medical textbook or a legal textbook where it says, and this is how you describe this law. It's much more. Um, fluid, a lot more all over the place in many more, much more interesting, but a lot more complex to understand and wrap your mind around. Anybody else, anything that comes to mind when you think of Talmud? Anybody think about, you know, something complicated, Talmudic mind, or people, you might have heard that idea or something that's complex and dense or that requires a lot of brain power. Um, and so, uh, I mean, the Talmud is really, in, in many ways, a very mis mysterious book. There is no other book that I've ever come across anywhere that even, come even comes close to being similar to the Talmud. It's really its own thing. And when you, you know, people think about the Talmud as a book of Jewish wisdom, but, um, you know, when we think of a book of, of wisdom, you think, well, here's a collection of sayings of sages, right? That's a group of wisdom. And that's, there's one tiny, tiny part of the Talmud called the Ethics of the Fathers, which is like that, a collection of wisdom, of teachings. Um, but really the Talmud is so many things and so complex and vast. And the basis of, uh, of Judaism is really on the Talmud. I mean, the Torah is like the foundation stone under all of it, but really we're, we're, living, we're living the Talmud um, these days. Um, and when, and when people in traditional centers of learning, yeshivas, right, where people who are very religious spend hours studying, they're not studying the Torah day in, day out. They're studying the Talmud for 12 hours a day, 10 hours a day, 16 hours a day. They're dreaming about it. It's filling their minds. And the Talmud um, is so vast and so complicated that you need to have a really well into mind to be able to understand it for many reasons and we'll get into it um part of it is that the Talmud's written in western colloquial babylonian jewish aramaic so uh, half half of it is that and half of it is hebrew um the other reason that the Talmud is such a complicated uh, document um is that the Talmud. Um, is, is, is a recording of a conversation that never happened. So if you kind of imagine, well, what would Washington say to um, President Reagan? And then what would President Reagan say to Lincoln in response to this? And then you try to imagine that and you wrote it all in short form and with a sense of artistic flair and religious passion, you would, you would, that's approaching what the Talmud is like. It's bringing rabbis who never spoke into conversation with each other in a very highly structured way. And that's just part of it. The other, you can find recipes in the Talmud. You can find philosophical rants. You can find stories that you would never expect in a holy book. Um, you can find all kinds, of, all kinds of things. And the richness, there's so much richness in it. And you know, when we think of like the shtetl, when we think of Fiddler on the Roof and the Judaism, the, that communal Judaism, that can all be rooted back to the Talmud. Um, and, you know, it, it's, it's one of those funny things that people think, well, no, Jews, Jews are the people of the Torah, which we are, but we're not only the Torah. And there was this period in history during the Middle Ages when the, um, when, when, uh, when the Jews were living among the Catholics um, in um, in, in, in Europe and they started, they always thought of the Jews as being followers of the Torah. And they said, well, they're kind of like preserving um, the, the integrity of the ancient 
of the uh, Old Testament for us. Um, but then they found out that the Jews were actually Talmudic and they started to be these great debates, you know, and they didn't like what there was in the Talmud and there was a whole series of, uh, of difficult encounters because they realized that the Jews in many ways were living the Talmud, were not only living the Torah. Um, but the truth is that it's a lot more complicated than that. Yeah, there's how we came to become um, Talmudic or in some ways rabbinic is in some, one of the most um, interesting and powerful stories. It's just an incredibly interesting thing. And the Talmud, we're not going to be able to, all of us really in this short time, you know, understand what the Talmud is um, legally or how all the different parts of it, because it's so very vast. It takes, if you were to study one page a day for seven years, it would take, it would take seven years to study one page a day. And one page of Talmud is not like a, one page of a novel. It's like, it's, 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 you're condensing, you know, 30 legal pages into shorthand, again, in a Western colloquial Jewish Babylonian Aramaic. Um, and so it's super dense. Um, so one page of Talmud is really hard. And most people who do the one page a day, they just really skim through it. They have, they don't really understand much of what they're reading because to really study a page well takes a long time. Um, and even, even if you've been trained for many years, but what we will do is come to understand today the story of a Talmud, where the Talmud is coming from. And that's a really powerful story that I think is really, really important to understand Judaism today, um, and especially the Judaism of the last 2,000 years. So um, anybody have any questions before we start or any thoughts about the Talmud or about any of this? Um, and if, if you have any questions, feel free to um, either just unmute yourself and speak or put it in the chat. Um, I'm going to be doing a PowerPoint for most of it, so um, I might not see the chat. Hello, Charles. Good to see you. Um, and so Glad to be here. A little late. Oh, sorry. sorry. No worries. Um, so feel free to, 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 to get the button if you have a question and interrupt me, and I'm always happy to have discussions in the middle. And so one thing I've added to the lesson that was in the book um, is we're going to be studying a little bit of Talmud together um, as well. Um, so we are going to begin. So I'm going to share. Let's see, here we go. Um, so I want to be able to start my presentation. Okay. How do I start the presentation when I've got, so I'm going to stop sharing for a minute and then start my presentation and then I'll be able to go through it because the, there we go, okay. The sidebar from Zoom was blocking my ability to press on the button. Okay, here we go. Okay, can everybody see? Good. Perfect. So the, the class is called the Rabbinic Revolution. Um, and uh, it's kind of an, an interesting way that they phrased. Why am I not able to go? OK, here we go. Sorry. It's been a little bit of time since I used PowerPoint last. There we go. OK. So this is the story of a revolution. It's the story of how Judaism came to the brink of extinction almost 2,000 years ago, but instead of dying out, it reinvented itself completely. And um, it's a good description of what we're going to be talking about. And we often talk about how the Talmud came out of the ashes of the Second Temple, how um, out of that uh, brink of the extinction came um, the Judaism that we live now. And so that sentence of revolution um, is good, but I, I see it even in, in a slightly different way. I see it um, in a much more intense way. There's so much, the Talmud for all of its law, for all of its recipes and stories and wild stuff has so much emotion in it, if you listen carefully, um, has so much pathos because um, the, 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 the Jews who live at the end of the second temple, we're going to be really getting into the midst of that, but the Jews who live at the end of the second temple, when the temple was destroyed and the people were exiled, really felt like they were living in an apocalyptical time. It was, I mean, imagine living 
um, at a time where everything you love and everything you hold dear and is just destroyed and you have to somehow rebuild that um, just you and a few of your friends and you're unsure if you'll ever be able to do it. And that only begins to capture some of that feeling, some of what they were going through. And we're going to be talking a lot more about it. Um, but what's so interesting is that now when we think about Judaism, um, we think of traditions, we think about things never changing. We think of the rabbis and the traditions as creating a system that's so a little bit rigid. And when we think that the more religious you are, we think of the, the, the ultra-Orthodox of black hats and how um, law has been uh, very difficult to change for hundreds, if not longer than that. But the first rabbis at the beginning of this whole period were revolutionaries. They were radicals. They were, they were wandering, as the Talmud says, they were walking on the beach thinking, you know, what is the best blessing to say when you see the sea? Or what should we do in this situation? They were trying to create something out of nothing because the temple was destroyed. So they were unable to live the Judaism that existed for over a thousand years. They were trying to do something completely different. Um, so they were revolutionaries and they had very little to work with, but they, what they worked with created what we live now. And some of the things that Jews are so proud about now that Jewish mind and all, oh, well, you know, my, my mother-in-law sends me every few months a list of all the Jewish Peace Prize, Nobel Prizes and, you know, all the, all the uh, Pulitzer Awards we've won and all these. And I say, well, this looks like the same list you sent me two months ago. Um, but it's, uh, it, their Jews are very proud of all of that. And that a lot of that comes out of, um, comes out of this period, comes out of the revolutionary, the radical thinking of the rabbis 2000 years ago after the temple was destroyed. Um, so this is a little bit what we're gonna be looking at. We're gonna be doing some history. We're gonna be doing um, some learning together. Um, and this is a map of the period that we're gonna be looking at, which is really the period leading up to the destruction of the um, second temple. Um, and so we're going to begin um, in 539 BC. So in 500, um, we're gonna go first to give you a little sense of what came before. Um, so the beginning, right? In the beginning, Bereshit, the beginning of the Torah tells um, the mythic story, the mythical stories, the great stories of where we all come from, the Jewish people, humanity. Um, and eventually we get to the story of the Jews who go down into Egypt and then they leave Egypt and they, have a moment of mass revelation at Sinai and they become a holy people and a holy nation and they wander the desert for 40 years. And then the Torah ends before they enter the promised land, right? Before they enter the promised land, the Torah begins back in the beginning because that's the most powerful period of who we are that defines us. Um, but the truth is that we do have the record of what happens after they do ah, finally do arrive in the promised land. And that's the beginning of the next stage of Jewish history, which is the rest of the Bible, um, the book of prophets, um, especially, in that they, they enter the land, they conquer the land, and for about a thousand years, um, uh, even, even more, about let's say 13, 1400 years, they lived on the land um, and they went through many things. And for the first um, thousand of those years, or a little bit less, let's say the first seven to 800 of those years, they lived at a time of incredible spiritual power. I mean, this is what we read about, that they were prophets walking the land and they still had the very same 10 commandments according to tradition that Moses had brought down from Mount Sinai. I mean, they had the temple in Jerusalem where they, they had those 10 commandments and God's presence was so powerful, says a tradition, in that holy of holies in the middle of the temple, that the once a year when the high priest entered there on Yom Kippur, if he wasn't prepared spiritually, he would die from the intensity of that spiritual force. Um, and people lived, um, there was a sense of God's protection over the people. I mean, there was many things that happened, but there were miracles, people who spoke directly to God. It was just, a, it's where most of our, um, Bible comes from those period. King David, King Solomon. It was just a, you know, it's out of out of that um, that our, our our most profound identity was created when the Torah was really um, telling the story of the Jewish people. 
But that came to an end eventually because the people were not doing what they were supposed to and the prophets were telling, um, telling them, you're not taking care of the widows and the orphans and those in need. You know, you're, you are, you're not um, safeguarding um, the laws um, and precepts that God gave us. And God doesn't care about your sacrifices in the temple if you're not taking care of your people. And according to our internal story, um, we didn't listen. And then eventually the first temple was destroyed. And the first temple destroyed was the end of a second period. That's in 586 BC, um, because it marks um, the end of that first period of closeness to God in the way we understand it. Um, because after that, we lost the Ten Commandments, even though we'll have a second temple, we did not have the second, we did not have the tablets or the ark um, in the second temple. And um, basically, there were no more prophets. We had a few more prophets, which kind of went into the end of the second temple period, but we uh, lost prophetic Judaism. Um, but something else came in, which was positive and probably needed. Judaism evolved. And so um, when Judaism, you know, at the end of 586, the temple is destroyed, the Jews are exiled, um, all of the ar aristocracy and all of the the people of, of learning and power were sent to Babylonia. And there they, and, and there they're finally, um, <clears throat> the dream is over, there's no more temple, um, they've lost, you know, they think God has divorced them in some sense. Um, and they have this question of, well, how do we live Judaism now that we're in Babylonia and we're far away from our land? And this is probably where we have the first, we don't have many records of this, but we think this is probably where the first synagogue comes because people start to say, well, how do you live Judaism outside of Israel? And how do you live Judaism um, without a temple? And so they, they created um, places to meet. And they also start to think about, well, we need to preserve our stories and our texts and make those more central to us because those you can take wherever you go. Um, those texts are, are central to who we are. So here is when the second temple period begins. Um, the Babylonians who were this um, people who went around the Middle East, the Near East, create, you know, committing genocide and exiling people and killing, um, their, the Babylonian empire and the new empire takes its place. Um, and King Cyrus of Persia takes power. And he's a much more um, uh, open and, um, different kind of ruler than the Assyrians and Babylonians before him, still ruling over much of the Near East, but wanting to give religious autonomy to most groups. So he allows the Jews to go back to um, Israel, even though they're not completely autonomous, but basically mostly autonomous. They're far away from Iraq, which is Babylonia, when they go back there. Um, and Syria, so we, ha we have records of this. So this, is, this we know is true. Um, he allows the Jews to go back by the tens of thousands. Not everybody wants to go back because they've made a nice life for themselves in Babylonia. Not, all, not everybody wants to go back to the backwater of Israel in those days. But a core group goes back led by Ezra and the and um, <clears throat> by Ezra and Nehemia. And they, who are two Jews who became very powerful in Babylonia, and they come back to Israel and they say, we're going to rebuild the temple, as all our prophecies had always said, the remnant is going to go back to Israel and we're going to try again, you know, take two, Judaism, take two, let's try and do this again. So they go back to Israel and they rebuild the temple, but um, much of Israel has been taken over by kind of other people and uh, basically much of Israel is only centered around Jerusalem and the first temple, Solomon's temple was beautiful and um, the second temple is quite small. It's really, it's a small thing. And because there'd only been 70 years in between, there were still some people alive who remember the first temple. And it says in the book of Ezra and Nehemiah that they cried when they saw the second temple because they looked at it and it was so small. And, um, and but the, yet there still were several prophets and they rededicated the people and they brought purity. And, um, and here begins a period which is totally mysterious because we have almost no records of it. This is from around 515 BC, the dedication of the second temple to when Alexander the Great conquers in 333. So one of the big questions of uh, Jewish history, so I'm gonna go forward here. Um, so Ezra and Nehemiah, the decree of Cyrus. Um, 
one of the, the big questions of historians is, why did the Jews survive? I think there's at least one book about that. So many other ancient peoples disappeared, but why have the Jewish people endured and kept going? And why have we never, you know, when other people have been exiled to other lands, they usually disappear and become just part of the population of where they are. And why did Jews not do that? And why are we still around when all the Edomites and the Moabites and the Babylonians and all the Assyrians and all the other ancient people disappeared? And one of the theories is that during this period from when we returned from Babylon um, until when the Greeks came in, we were basically left to ourselves. So for that period of um, two centuries, almost, we just built our culture and we were just among ourselves and we lived our culture um, and we were just able, our religious culture, we were able to just deepen it and deepen our sense of identity and who we are and we were in our land. And um, in Judaism always been this sense of how important our land is to us, right? From the very beginning, God says to Abraham, you know, leave the land where you are and go to the land that I will show you. And it says in the Talmud, that a Jew outside of Israel is a little bit crazy. Um, so it's almost a sense of there is this um, uh, alignment that happens when Jews are in their land, for good and sometimes for worse, but um, Jews feel empowered in their land. When I talk about it, I think about it almost the way you know Native Americans might talk about, you know, I, I don't know how many of you ever read Tony Hillerman. He has mystery novels about the Navajos. Anyway, um, you know, the way Navajos would feel about the Navajo land or others, you know, this is the land that empowers them, that gives them a sense of self, all their stories come from. So Jews were able to live on their land in peace with nothing bothering them under the umbrella of the Persian Empire, but really able to live their own self. And we know almost nothing of what happened in this time, except that the priesthood was very important and there were high priests and there were some, the very end of prophecy in these years. So there were still people who were able to communicate, who said they were directly receiving God's word, which if you think about it is an incredible concept, you know, to directly hear God's word and people uh, felt that. Um, and so this period created this intense Jewish identity, which helped us survive for a long time, but also created some trouble um, in the next period, which begins in 333 BC when Alexander the Great, one of the great conquerors of ancient times, conquers half the world, including little, little Palestine, little Israel. And suddenly we're not just among ourselves living our little Jewish culture, we're in the middle of Hellenic culture, of Greek culture. And I mean, it's completely different. I mean, we believe in invisible gods and the Greeks believed in many gods. And they thought, you know, you Jews are so strange. You have no statues in your temple. What is wrong with you? And what's this business about circumcision? And, you know, didn't God create us perfect? And, you know, what is these strange customs you have of not eating pork and of, you know, not working on one day a week? It all seems very provincial. Um, and suddenly we're in the midst of this much greater world and we're just a small little outpost and our culture is completely under threat um, because you know our culture was very strong and we just been in our the beautiful hills and valleys of the promised land for hundreds of years in our our little area and suddenly we're, we're threatened by these greek ideas which are different than ours and which clash with ours and the jews were and a lot of our practices like we've been we're still sacrificing animals in a temple and that's starting to feel a little bit backwards and primitive and um, to some people and some of the, the Jewish, you know, the educated Jewish people in Jerusalem and others are starting to want to be part of the greater world and not just be part of our own little, our own little culture. And at the same time, there are Jewish communities developing all around the Jewish, the, the Mediterranean basin. So finally, most people don't notice, but uh, when by the end of the second temple, about they say 10 to maybe even 25% of the whole Mediterranean area was Jewish. That's Jew Judaism was spreading at the same time as a counterculture to the Greek culture um, for hundreds of years and really been quite successful. So in Egypt where the, uh, the Ptolemies, which, which and the Seleucids, Seleucids, I can't remember anymore to say these, um, were in um, Asia, in the Middle East. 
And some of the communities in Egypt, I mean, this is so funny because it reminds one of America or later Germany, but uh, in the communities, by the end of this period, um, the communities were so big in Egypt. They say the synagogues were so large and there were so many people there that um, you had to have people with a big sign that would say amen to let the people at the back of the synagogue know when to say amen to prayers. That's how big the synagogues and they were wealthy and they'd forgotten Hebrew and they needed to translate, you know, the Torah into Greek. Um, so there was already the sense of diaspora, which would, you know, be part of the Jewish people for so long, one of our tropes. I um, mean, this all begins during this and this is in this period of ferment and of change and of transformation, not that unlike ours. So um, before we get to um, the, in the middle of that, we have the Maccabean revolt where the Greeks led by Antiochus um, finally have a moment where they wanna take further what had been happening naturally and stamp their culture on the Jews. And Antiochus said, this is a story of Hanukkah said, you know, you can't, uh, you know, uh, Jews are no longer allowed to follow their customs. And he brought pigs into the temple and, um, you know, they started to um, really create a, a Greek culture in Jerusalem and try and move Jews away from their culture. Um, and that did not sit well with the traditionalists who'd been around for hundreds of years. And a group of traditionalists armed with spears said, we're not going to cave into this. And they were zealots and they, they you know, they, they attacked anyone, including Jews who were allied with the Greeks. And they were so passionate and so full of zeal that they defeated the much greater Greek armies over four years and established an independent Jewish kingdom um, in, um, in Israel, right before it had been under the, the Persians and the Greeks, but it became completely independent until 63 BC. Um, this was an odd period, you know, the Maccabees are celebrated in modern Judaism as those who, you know, restored the temple. And this is the story of Hanukkah and they found oil um, that was supposed to last, that would have lasted only for one day, but there was a miracle and it lasted eight days. But truly the Maccabees were actually horrible rulers. Um, they were corrupt. Um, they instated their own people to be high priests. So they kind of removed the distinction between the priesthood um, and the, the government. Um, and they also um, were um, not that effective eventually in keeping the much greater power of the Greek, what would become the, then the Roman Empire, out from Israel. And as they became more corrupt, and there's these stories, which is really important to understanding where the Talmud comes from, that in this period is really where the corruption and the priesthood in the Second Temple begins. Um, you know, the priesthood became hereditary, so it wasn't just became more hereditary, um, but it wasn't, it wasn't just given to um, the priests who were meriting it, um, but it became in rich families in Jerusalem and the greatest positions always went to the rich people. And eventually they even started to appoint high priests who were from wealthy families and who were connected to um, you know, the more Greek culture. And so it was a sense of the slow corruption of the temple and during this period, at the same time, as the temple became more corrupted and even probably start, stopped making sense to people, the, the, the kinds of worship that had been going on for a thousand years. Um, because with the Greek culture also came a lot of texts and philosophy and other traditions and other intellectual ideas and culture. Um, and the Greeks um, brought in interesting ideas. And so at the same time, there was a scribal culture that started to exist um, within um, the uh, within uh, Israel, people who were more based on text and on studying the Torah and thinking about the Torah than just sacrificing animals in the temple, right? Until then, all of Jewish life was pretty much, you came to the temple on the holidays, you sacrificed an animal to say sorry to God. I mean, you felt God's presence because it was everywhere, at least that's the way tradition experiences it. There was ideas of purity and impurity. If you were pure, you could enter the temple. If you weren't, you were not able to. Um, but there wasn't, there weren't so many other modes of religious expression. And so there were people who were not priests, but said, hey, I, I'd like to be a religious leader. And they started to try and create other forms of worship. Um, so then the Romans come eventually, and the Romans is like um, the Greeks times 30, um, very heavy handed in ruling Israel. They established puppet kings who were half Jewish and who didn't really care about the Jewish people. 
Um, they put down rebellions. They were, um, you know, the way they were everywhere else. They, they imposed Roman ideas and Roman thoughts. And the Jews who had been living with their own culture, they still had that strong sense of identity, so it did not go well. So one of the kings to remember is Herod. So Herod takes this, Herod is a Jewish king, but really he's very connected to the Romans. And he wants to take the second temple, which is mentioned, but was really small, and make it into one of the great temples of the ancient world. So Herod renovates the temple and really makes what could be called the third temple and creates this magnificent, incredible temple, um, which is one of the beauties of the ancient world, which creates a lot of pride for Jews. And Herod is, he pretty much respects the Jewish laws of what should go on, but the temple is still very corrupt at this point. And um, Herod, Herod with the Romans um, really um, creates many, imposes terrible labor on the Jewish people. They create Masada, which is one of the great sites in Israel. Um, Herod on top of a, a, a mountain or really a, a big hill by the Dead Sea created this beautiful fortress, that picture on the right hand side. Um, and that was supposed to be a, one of his many fortresses and palaces that he built with you know, the labor of his people and the taxes of his people. Um, but anyway, eventually the people, the zealots rebel against Herod and you have um, in 70 CE, the Romans destroyed the temple because of their anger at the Jews' rebellion. And then the Jews rebel again in 132, the Bar Kokhba revolt. And because the Jews were just such zealots back then, they just could not, they did not want to live with the Roman or Greek culture or ideas. And after the Bar Kokhba rebellion, which is a really important moment, it's kind of like the end of the Jewish warrior for about 2000 years of after that. That was the last time until the modern state of Israel, there have been no Jewish warriors. Uh, but Bar Kokhba, the Jews put in a huge revolt, that eventually was put down by the Romans. And then the Romans punished them by killing hundreds of thousands, exiling almost everybody else away from Israel. And that should have been the end of the Jewish people, but it was not. And that's really one of the greatest, mo the, one of the worst moments for the Jewish people. Um, so what was it like back then? Um, I don't know how many of you have seen the, the Life of Brian, the Monty Python movie. So that, that's a very funny movie, which describes this period just before the destruction of the second temple. Um, around the time when Jesus was, um, and it was kind of like um, a time of great tension and everybody, if people thought the apocalypse was around the corner because the Jewish culture they'd been living no longer made sense anymore. Um, the Roman culture was everywhere, but at the same time, there was just a sense of apocalypse. Like people thought it's the end of days. Um, the Messiah is going to come at any moment now to save us. You know, he's the Messiah. No, he's the Messiah. No, he's the Messiah. That's kind of what it was like. Um, and um, these are the, the five different groups that historians like to talk about in those days, but there were more. So there were the Pharisees. And those were the people who were not part of the temple worship very much. Uh, but they were the ones I talked about who were part of that scribal culture, who were trying to find other ways to lead Judaism. Um, and who had new ideas which were considered crazy, like people have a soul. People didn't believe in the soul back then or that anything happened after you died. Um, and they had these new ideas and they were shunned by the Sadducees um, who were the next group. They were the traditionalists who ran the temple and who also um, were associated with the aristocracy in Jerusalem. And they, they just believed the letter of the law as it had been handed down for thousands of years and they were completely opposed to the Pharisees, thought they were just uh, radicals. Um, and the Sadducees were just, they wanted to continue doing everything the same way. One of the, one of the interesting stories in the Talmud is of in these days of turmoil in the temple, uh, one of the revolutionaries managed to get one of their people's high priest. And when he went into the Holy of Holies on Yom Kippur, instead of lighting the incense inside the Holy of Holies, he lit it just outside to show how different he was and just outside and then entered. And that created a, a stir and rebellion that killed hundreds of people. So it was that kind of period where everybody was trying to say, no, we have the right way. And then, and then at the same time, there were these people called the Essenes who lived around the Dead Sea, which if, if you ever been to Israel is a, a desert area, the lowest point on earth. And they were, they've been compared, described like 
ancient hippies. Um, they were very spiritual. They were mystics. They lived by the Dead Sea. They were waiting the Messiah. Um, they lived holy lives. Some of them were celibate. Some of them were not. They, you know, they thought both the Pharisees and Sadducees were all corrupt. They wanted to rebuild a new temple that was that would have been according to their ideas. Um, and then there were the zealots. The zealots were particularly religious. There were just many groups of them. Um, they, they all, they just wanted to throw, they were nationalists. They were Jewish nationalists who just wanted to throw the Romans out. And they were as much opposed to each other as they were to the Romans. And they eventually um, just um, doomed Jerusalem during the siege of Jerusalem by the Romans. They burned the food that was left in Jerusalem to try and force people to go fight. You can imagine the burning all the food during a siege was not a very good idea. Um, and then there were the Jesus community, the, the Nazarenes, who were following Jesus, who was a rabbi, who was, um, you know, saying he was the Messiah. There might have been others too at the same time. And they were, they still had other ideas about not following the law, that the law was outdated and that Jesus was embodying um, all the old prophecies. So you can imagine with all these different groups in a pretty small country, what, what, a, what, a, what an interesting but messy time it was. Um, and in the middle, you have that great revolt, which ends up leading to the destruction of the temple. Um, but it's hard to um, really emphasize um, how, how, how impactful it was when the temple was destroyed. Um, it, it had stood in one form or the other, except for those years in Babylonia for a thousand years. Um, and this was the way um, the people were used to worshiping. And even more than that, um, the way we understand it, right, for hundreds of years, the prophets had said, God is going to leave you because you are not living the way you can. And the, the symbol of God leaving them was a temple because God dwelt in the temple. I remember once being at the Western Wall and, you know, the Western Wall is the only remnant of the second temple. Um, and it's not of a temple. It's the outer wall of the temple. It's still right, our holiest place in Judaism. And next to me were two French guys. And I grew up in France, so I speak French. And one of them was saying, Oh, how can where God must be so sad that he does not have a house anymore? And that's literally how Judaism believed, and m many of us still believe that way. That you know, the, the, the temple in Jerusalem, and actually, when you go to Jerusalem and you're standing at the Western Wall, it's you feel the power of that place. It is a powerful place, and you can imagine what it was like when the actual temple was there. Um, and the and there was the and the Holy of Holies, and it's a sense of the, the spiritual power of that, the way Judaism believes that the power of that radiated to the entire world, right? We're very mystical here, but that's what we believed. And that what was in the temple, it was so beautiful and so powerful. And, you know, just that, you know, when the, when the high priest went into the Holy of Holies and then came out on Yom Kippur and blessed the people, our belief is they were all wiped clean, that there was a, a, a kind of mass spiritual moment that, that reflected what happened on Mount Sinai. Um, and there was just this belief, I mean, this place that pilgrims had gone to for a thousand years and that was consecrated. And it was just um, something of, even as it was corrupt, at the same time, it was still our center, the way it would always been there. A thousand years is a long time. Um, and the prophets had spoken about it. And it was just, you know, they say people would walk into it. And the moment they walked into the temple, they felt peace. It was called the shelter of peace. And they would, as they went on pilgrimage, you could see the temple, it's white marble shining um, even far away from Jerusalem as you started to make the pilgrimage up the hill. So you'd see the Mikdash, the holy temple, um, and suddenly um, it was gone. And not only was it gone, but the, the Romans eventually built something on top of it to really let you know you were, you're in getting your temple back. Um, and it was, it was just... Um, apocalyptical. And then when the people were total, when the people were exiled from the land after the Bar Kokhba revolt, because they did ban it around Bar Kokhba, who said, no, he was the Messiah. And even some of the rabbis had supported him. And those rabbis would support them were put to death by the Romans. Um, and suddenly it was like, no, this is really the end. This is really um, something of tremendous um, law, uh, time of tremendous loss. And most of the, the leaders were dead or exiled and the aristocracy was gone. And all the people who were a group, who were a group, 
who were left were a small group of survivors who had been called themselves the Pharisees. Um, and they suddenly were like, well, what do we do? Is this just the end? Do we just become Roman or do we just become Greek? And how do we continue Judaism? We don't even know what Judaism looks like. What is Judaism without a temple, without sacrifices? And, you know, what do we do with all of it? How do we, how do we live? And this is where, um, and they also felt if there's no more temple and it's hard, again, they, they felt this experientially the God was no longer with them. They felt God had divorced them. The destruction of the temple was like God saying, see you later, Jewish people. I want nothing to do with you. You are, you are left to yourselves. And so the rabbis, like, how do we feeling divorced by God, decimated, no temple? How do we create Judaism? But they did one step at a time, one small step at a time. They moved forward and they built a new, a new mountain, a new structure, a new temple. Um, and they began to call themselves rabbis instead of Pharisees. And we're not exactly sure how many, how much of the population even listened to them back then. Were they, were they just people kind of wandering around, um, you know, talking their, um, wait, there's a chat. I'm just going to look. Can you please afford the, yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, the Jews, the Jews were just living in this time of, of, of tremendous uh, destruction. And, and we don't know how many people were following him at the beginning, but we know as a groups of rabbis will start to say, well, you know what, we can't, we can't do sacrifices, but we can pray. And then other rabbis say, well, what should we pray? And other rabbis will say, well, let's pray this way. And other rabbis say, no, we pray this way. And then the followers of one rabbi would pray one way, and other followers would pray one way. And eventually one way would become dominant, and that would become the way people would do it. And there were disagreements, like, and some people would say, well, you know, I saw this rabbi when he would do Havdalah, the ritual at the end of Shabbat, hold this cup, um, and then do the spices. And the other would say, no, I see him first hold the spices. And, you know, they would start to record all of this and start to um, build it up. And the other thing to think about um, is that on some, to some degree, they were inventing probably a lot of it, but that's not how they themselves saw it and not how it's presented to traditional Judaism. Because there was always this concept that there was a written Torah and an oral Torah. And the written Torah is the Torah itself. Um, but there was always an idea that um, with the written Torah were traditions of how to live it. Because the Torah says, keep Shabbat. Okay, great. How do I keep Shabbat? You know, I need more than just one sentence on how to keep Shabbat in the Torah doesn't really tell you much about how to keep Shabbat. So the tradition is that on Mount Sinai, God gave Moses an oral Torah, oral Torah because it was spoken and not written down, and there was more malleable, and in some ways has always been how you put it all into practice. And the very religious Jews now believe that everything about how we live now was already handed down to Moses at the exact same moment. And I would say less, less Orthodox Jews believed that what would happen on that mountain was that Moses received a way of being, a state of mind, a, a understanding of Judaism that then was reinterpreted in every generation to be the oral Torah, how every generation lived the Torah. Um, but part of what they did was be, so you see Hillel, who was one of the very first rabbis, wrote, if I am not for myself, who will be for me? If I'm only for myself, what am I? If not, now when? Um, which is kind of talking about how the rabbis saw it. They had to take on their own re or their responsibility to save Judaism. Um, and they also started to look at Judaism in a much more democratic way. You know, let's bring Judaism into the home. Let's make the home this, the temple. Let's make the Friday night Shabbat meal, the altar, just like, you know, where you make sacrifices in the temple. Instead of making a sacrifice, you eat your Shabbat meal. Um, let's have rituals for everything. Let's make everything. Let's be, you know, when God said you should be a kingdom of priests on Mount Sinai, let's, let's make it not so there's only a group of priests who are hereditary. Let's make all of us into priests. Let's all be priests. Let's reinvent ourselves in a different way. Um, and at the same time, um, they, they started to think about, well, how do we because they, at the same time as they were reinventing, they always felt like they were in the shadow of the temple. They were in the shadow of prophets or in the shadow of a much greater period than themselves. They thought of themselves as being much lesser. He said, how can we link everything that we're doing to what happened before? Um, 
And so um, everything was linked to the Torah, but the Torah was already really old. So people like Rabbi Akiva, who was one of the great rabbis of this time, said, you know what? You can take every word in the Torah. No, you can take every letter in the Torah. You can take every crown that's on top of a letter in the Torah, and it's telling you something. It's in giving you an interpretation of how to live Jewish life. And that gave them the flexibility to do all kinds of things. And the rabbis were very aware of it. There's one midrash. A midrash is a, a story that the rabbis wrote where they, they write um, a story about Moses being on top of Mount Sinai. And he's receiving the Torah and he's there for 40 days and 40 nights. And God talks to him and he tells, and he says, God, well, what's the Torah going to look like, you know, in a long time from now? And God says, well, let me show you. So he takes Moses into the Beit Midrash, the study hall of Rabbi Akiva. And Rabbi Akiva is observing what's happening. He's hearing Rabbi Akiva talk, and Moses does not understand a single word of what Rabbi Akiva is talking about. And Moses is starting to get very worried, like, what, this is Judaism now? But then at the end, he hears Rabbi Akiva says, and this is a teaching that was handed down from Moses at Sinai. And Moses understands that even if he doesn't understand it, they're at least trying to say that it came down from Moses. They're trying to keep the spirit of where it came from. And Moses feels better about it. Um, because the rabbis were really creating something that really was very different. Here you have a quote, um, which um, is very important. Many bar and bar mitzvah boys and girls talk about this for their bar mitzvah. But this is one of the statements of maybe where rabbinic Judaism was based on, the three pillars. You know, they taught the, well, um, the world on the right side. The world rests on three pillars, on Torah, on service, and on deeds of loving kindness. So Torah is Torah learning, learning Torah and immersing yourself in what the Torah means. Because in biblical times, people were essentially still living the Torah. They were in mythical times. But you know, if you're no longer living in mythical times, then you can at least study mythical times. If you don't feel close to God anymore, you can at least read about when we were close to God. And that gives you a sense of connection to it. Um, and at the same time, if you're about to live in exile and under horrible conditions as a minority, that study, that never ending study will take up a lot of time and allow you to survive. On service, service in the temple was the worship of the sacrifice, but service became all of our prayer services and all of our blessings, right? In Judaism, we have a hundred blessings a day. So if you fill your life with blessings and with prayer, again, that, that creates that spiritual intensity that you're missing from not having the temple. And then on deeds of loving kindness. Well, if you're going to have to live outside of Israel in minority communities, if you're going to have to have a lot of loving kindness between each other to, to, to survive and to keep your communities going. So those three became the pillars of rabbinic Judaism. Um, and as I said, they mentioned it up to, they opened it up to everybody. And um, those first rabbis um, who were called Tanaim, T-A-N-N-A-I-M, um, they wrote the first big work of rabbinic Judaism called the Mishnah um, in the year 200, a little bit before. Um, and this was like taking all of these new forms of Judaism that they were thinking about, that they, a lot of them believed had come from earlier times, the Pharisees and maybe before. Um, and they codified it, they wrote it down because they thought, you know, we need to write this down. We can't just have this be the oral law. And that was in the year 200. And then other rabbis started, continued to work on it. Eventually, the center of Jewish life shifted from Israel to Babylon um, to Iraq, to Persia, where they were, had been there for already since the first exile um, and created very great communities. And there, there was an incredible rich period where they, they, they worked more and more and more to um, build on what had already been created. And they, the truth is that what's so fascinating is they used a lot of the Greek methods that Judaism had been in um, tension with for hundreds of years of logic, of philosophy, of um, how to think about religion in more modern terms um, from the Greek and Persian world. Um, and they applied it to Judaism and they created what became the Talmud. And the Talmud um, is, is based on the Mishnah. The Mishnah is M-I-S-H-N-A-H which was that work, the, the first work of rabbinic Judaism in Israel created in the year 
about 180. Um, and they would start there, but then they would expand. And the Talmud begins as sugya. Sugya is one, um, one um, specific part of the, of the Talmud. It begins with, let's say, it begins with a Mishnah on, um, you know, when do you start to say the Shema? And the Mishnah will have an answer, but then the Gemara, which is another name for the Talmud, um, the Gemara um, takes it much further and says, okay, well, we know you say the Shema at this time, but why this time? And they'll say, well, we, we have a record of a rabbi um, 200 years ago who had a different opinion. And then they'll say, wait, um, he was taught, he decided to say the Shema in the morning when you can tell the difference between um, the blue on your talit and you know the, the white on your talit. And then they'd be like, well, what was the color of blue on the talit? And then there'd be like a side note of what's the color of blue? And then what is a talit? And then you know other stories of that same rabbi. So it's very associative and it builds um, these sections, these sugiot, which are very heavily edited. Um, editors of the Talmud came later and turned them into these, these masterpieces, these artistic masterpieces, um, bringing together philosophy and um, stories and Jewish law. And it's kind of like seeing Jewish law being created in front of your eyes. But again, they believe that those early rabbis were the most authoritative. So if you were a rabbi in Babylon in the year 500, and you were trying to figure out, well, what's the law? When, do I, when should I say the Shema? Should I say it when the sun rises? Or should I say it a little bit later? You've got these records of rabbis back in Israel 300 years before, and you're trying to pit them against each other to figure out what exactly was the right thing. And part of it is you're trying to figure out the right thing, but there's also this amazing, the joy in the process of studying, of asking questions, of trying to figure out what's the right way to do it. And eventually this is like, well, we don't have prophecy anymore, but this is how we figure out God's will, by asking questions, by uh, debating each other, by trying to pit the old sources with the new sources. Um, and in that method, you find the divine. So out of that comes basically modern Judaism, rabbinic Judaism. Um, and so much of Judaism comes from there. So as I said, you have the Mishnah, the first collection of rabbinic legal teachings compiled around 200, but really 180 by Rabbi Judah the Prince, one of the first leaders of the rabbis. And then you have the Gemara, which is the extended commentary on the Mishnah, um, which is the, the much greater part of the Talmud. The Mishnah is short and the Gemara, which makes up the whole rest of the Talmud is much uh, greater. Um, so the, the Talmud is the Mishnah and Gemara. There are approximately 5,000 arguments Right, and only 50 come to definitive conclusion. Oi. Um, so this is where you get that Jewish sense of argument and of never coming to a good answer. And I remember I grew up in Israel and in France, and when, there's one movie in France, which all, all uh, French people know everything they know about Jews from this one movie. And it's about, a uh, anyway, uh, one of the great comedians, French comedians who um, is has to dress up as a Jew. He's not Jewish, but he dresses up as a Hasidic Rebbe. And he asks the Jew, well, how, will, how can I pretend to be Jewish? So the, the, the other Jew tells him, if anybody asks you a question, just ask him another question back. Um, and that's kind of the Talmudic way. If you're asked a question, just ask another question back and keep on going. Um, and so this is like the most Jewish book ever in the sense of all the questions that come out of the Talmud. So this is the first page of Talmud. Um, and we're going to we're going to look at it quickly. Um, I think it's worth spending the time doing that. So this is what a page of Talmud looks like. Um, you'll see in the middle is the Mishnah. Um, the Mishnah, as I said, that's that was what was composed 180 or 200 in Israel, and then begins afterwards the Gemara. The Gemara is what was written in Babylon. Um, afterwards, but really was bringing all kinds of things. And so an example of how Talmud would go is um, people who study Talmud a lot like to have fun with it. But so, for example, you know, I will say, um, you know, you can, you, when, when you have a polar vortex, you can start Shabbat later. I would never say that, but this is me writing a modern Talmud. And then someone will say, well, what is a polar vortex? At what point is it a polar vortex? And someone say to the point where the 
you know, the ice freezes into icicles, that's when you know it is a polar vortex. And then they'll say, well, I remember the one time we had a polar vortex and Rabbi Hanina, who was the son of this, and I have a tradition going back, Rabbi Abba and Rabbi Mari and Rabbi Abba Bar Mari, who said that he only would start Shabbat earlier when there was a polar vortex, when um, the icicles reached all the way down to the floor. So, and then someone would say, well, I heard that, that story differently. I heard the polar vortex is only when the water freezes in 10 seconds. And then, so that's kind of like the way the Talmud works. It's like this endless, and, um, but it's written all in shorthand and they, they have specific terms of argument. So for example, there's a term which introduces an early text, which is authoritative. And then there's a text which pits two rabbis against each other. And then there's another term which tells you it's coming to a conclusion. And so it's very technical. It's kind of like a technical document. Um, and then you see on the right hand side, you see Rashi, who was a French rabbi much later on. Um, and you'll see it's written in something that looks different. It's a different script. They wrote in a, it's Hebrew, but it's Hebrew or Americ, but it's written in a different script. And he helps you understand it because it's so difficult to understand what they're talking about most of the time. It's so complex. Um, and then on the left-hand side is something called Tosafot, which comes even later, and that was a whole school of commentary who wrote commentary on the commentary on the commentary and really got to every fine point. They really try and understand it. Um, and again, this became part of the Jewish way of understanding. And this is what people do in yeshiva all day long is study the commentary and the commentary and try and come up with new commentary and new thoughts and it's all very intellectual um, and quite interesting um, and takes a lot of brain power and quite powerful and beautiful, um, but also very difficult. So the Talmud adds so many things. Communal prayer. There was no communal prayer in the Torah. It adds Shabbat candles. There were no Shabbat candles in Torah. It adds Kiddush, Passover Seder, Hanukkah, Purim, Chupa, meat and dairy dishes, Ketubah, Havdalah, Kosher slaughter, Kaddish. All of these things are just described in many details in the Talmud. And um, eventually all of that, the Talmud is so broad, you know, if you're trying to figure out how, to, you, know, you know, Maggie and her husband-to-be Sam are getting married. And if you're trying to figure out, well, what is my chupa supposed to look like? If you read the Talmud, you're going to be there all day because the Talmud is way too complex. So other rabbis after that um, took the Talmud and compiled it into much shorter documents which will just tell you, just tell me, what is the chupa supposed to look like? I don't want to know what this rabbi says and that rabbi says. I don't want to know the time where so-and-so built a chupa. I just, just tell me how to do it. So eventually Maimonides and others write codes of law to codify um, the Talmud and other, other sources. And so the Talmud um, reforms some biblical law. So before we do that, I wanted to do, we're going to stop sharing this. And I'm going to do something else for a minute, um, which is um, that first page of Talmud, because it's really important to me. Um, I'm, there's something I really believe in, the first page of Talmud. Why is that the first page of Talmud? And I want to show you a little bit what it looks like. Um, so let's see. I'm going to pick the first page of Talmud, and I'm going to go back here, and hopefully I should be able to share it. Let's see, there we go. So this is in English, the first page of Talmud. Um, would somebody like to read for us? Susan, do you mind reading for us just beginning from where we may one recite the Shema? Uh, Mishnah, Baruch beginning of the Mishnah. From when may one recite the Shema in the from the time when the Kohen Jerma produce consecrated for consumption until the end of the first watch, so says Rabbi Elias. So it's kind of like a weird place to begin, right? No introduction, nothing about this is what this book is about. It just starts. Anybody have any thoughts? Why start with the Shema? And why, why, why start with this question? From when may one recite the Shema in the evening? It's really, go ahead, Yochanan. Well, there's not really, I don't think there's really a beginning or end 
like it, it totally is an organized move. Like oftentimes, it, this first track date, Brecho, it'll cite uh, discussions from other track dates like Edu Yot or Baba Mitzia. So it's like the rabbinic principle, there's no beginning or end. There's no chronology in the Torah, it's the same thing like the Talmud, mm -hmm. I would think. Um, yeah, it's true. Every page of Talmud, they kind of suppose that you know the whole rest of the Talmud, which is a big supposition for most of us. Um, but um, there is something though, they did start with here. And, and the reason that I think, and this is my father is a rabbi too, and his, this is his little kiddush, his little teaching is, first of all, this is what the rabbis felt. They felt they were starting in the evening. They were starting at night. The temple was destroyed. They were starting in a place of darkness in a place of not knowing anything and saying, how can we have the chutzpah to build a new Judaism? Like, how can we actually think we can do this? And then the Shema, the Shema is our central prayer. It comes from the, um, from the Torah. And you'll notice that straight away, when do, how do they say when you can recite the Shema? They go back to what happened in the temple. This is what happened in the temple from the time when the Kohanim, the Kohanim are the priest, when they would go to eat their produce until the end of the first watch in the temple. It's such a small uh, technical detail, but showing you from the beginning, what we're doing is we're just building on the temple. We don't have a temple, but we're going to remember the temple and everything we do. And with everything that happens, we're going to remember the temple. And that's how they start the entire endeavor of the Talmud with that, um, with that um, expression. We're starting at night. We're starting with darkness. We don't have a temple. We don't have prophecy. And we're building on what came before us but we're going to move ahead. And from there, they go way ahead. Now, here's another uh, text, which I, I love, um, where they ask the question where it says the first night. What, are the, what is the first night, the first watch? So here is an explanation of the first watch. And in my mind, one of my most favorite parts of Talmud. Uh, Maggie, do you mind reading, uh, reading here? Rabbi Yitzchak. Rabbi Yitzchak, the son of Shmuel, said that, that in the name of God, the night has three watches, and for each watch, and every watch, the holy book of God spits and roars like a lion and lion. Boy, alas, the children, that because of the resistance, I destroyed my house and burnt my temple and exiled them from the nations of the world. Should I keep going? Yeah, please go ahead. It was taught that when there is a uh, uh, Rabbi Yosef yes, said, yes, I was once I was traveling on the road, and I entered I one entered of the roads of Jerusalem to pray. Eliyahu, uh, his, his memory be blessed, came and washed me by the entrance, the entrance. and I waited for me until I finished my prayer. After I finished my prayer, he said to me, Peace be unto you, my master. And I said to him, Peace be unto you, my master, my teacher. And he said to me, My son, why did you enter the room? And I said to him, And he said to me, You should have prayed on the road. And I said to him, I was scared that I could be interrupted by passerbys. And he said to me, You should have prayed a short prayer, abbreviated, and done. At that At moment, that I learned three things from him. I learned that I we learned cannot enter the room, that we pray on the prayer, and, and I learned that we can that pray a short prayer on the road. Thank you, Maggie. So um, if you go to the beginning, um, you know, it's talking about these three watches. And here we have this voice of God, right? For each watch, it's showing you how they felt, what they think God was saying. Like, where was God when the temple was destroyed? They felt God was in the heavens saying, Oi, I had to destroy my house. Oh, I had to destroy my house. And that's kind of like the feeling that they had, you know, the sense of being far away from God and God's upset and they're upset that they're, you know, they had to, you know, essentially separate or get divorced from God. And then we have this story. So Baraita is what I was talking about. Baraita is an early story. It's, a, it's an early text that they had um, from one of the early rabbis. Rabbi Yossi is an early rabbi. So this is like someone inside a center of learning in Babylon, hundreds of, in the year 400, and he hears them talk about the watches, and somebody says, hey, wait a second, I've got this fragment of a text, a Baraita from Rabbi Yossi, and this is what it taught. And so Rabbi Yossi, who's living, you know, at the time when the ruins of the temple were still there, so why is he traveling in the ruins of the temple of Jerusalem? Because that's a good place to pray, right? If you're going to pray, why not pray in the ruins of the temple, you know? 
Um, but then somehow Elijah, the prophet, and Elijah, we believe Elijah comes to the Passover Seder. He comes to every circumcision. He's like a prophet who's never dead. But he's also associated with the Messiah. So if you're praying in a temple and you see the prophet Elijah come, what do you think? You think, oh, he's come to tell me the Messiah has come. It's the end. We're going to rebuild the temple. But the, Elijah doesn't do. He just waits till he finishes praying. And then Elijah strangely says, peace be unto you, my master, which is a very strange thing for Elijah says. And then he says, okay, peace be unto you. And then he asks him, well, why did you enter this rune? Why did he enter this rune? Of course he entered this rune to pray. You know, this is the rune of the temple. And then he says to him, you should have prayed on the road. So on the road, well, I, you know, I could have been interrupted, but also, you know, why pray on the road? I've got the temple here. And then he says, you should have prayed a short prayer. And then he learns three things. He learns we do not enter runes, that we pray on the road, and that we can pray a short prayer on the road. And this is, in essence, the fundamentals of rabbinic Judaism, right? We can't, we're, we're going to keep the Torah the center of everything, but we can't stay in the ruins. We've got to start something new. We've got to move forward. We've got to create something new, you know? Like anybody who's coping with loss, when you experience loss, you have to move ahead. You can't just stay in the ruins. Charles, go ahead. You're about to say something. No? That's okay. So then, and then it's, we pray on the road, you know, the Jews now are on the road. They're going to be in exile for 2000 years, but you know what, even on the road, you got to pray. You got to be, you've got to, you got to move forward. We can't move backwards. You've got to create a new Judaism that's based on community. That's based on everything that we're doing. And finally, we learned that we can pray a short prayer on the road. So if you've ever, if you've ever been to any of our services, our services are nothing but short. You know, I remember going to see the Muslims pray Ramadan, and even the day before their holiest day, their prayer is 10 minutes long. And I said, you should come to our Yom Kippur services. They last all day long. Um, so our prayers are not short, but the rabbis believed that our prayers were short spiritually because they didn't feel God's presence the way they imagined their ancestors did. So they said, you know what? Spirituality is going to take a back bench for now because we're, we just need to survive. You can pray a short prayer on the road. Let's just survive and move forward and create communities of loving kindness. And let's make sure the Jews are still around in a few hundred years, never mind a few thousand years. And so this is kind of like, in my mind, their manifesto. We've just got to move forward and create a new Judaism. And then to really, what really blows one's mind is when you think about, this is to understand the power of the modern state of Israel. Because when the modern state of Israel comes back 2,000 years after this, it took 2,000 years to go back to Israel, suddenly you're like, well, what do we do? For 2,000 years, we've not entered ruins. For 2,000 years, we prayed on the road. For 2,000 years, we've been praying a short prayer. What do we do now? And so that moment in 1967 when Jewish, um, when Israel took back the Western Wall was that moment where suddenly we started to enter ruins again. So right now, um, we're actually living back in mythical times, a lot of people believe. We've re-entered the Bible because what has kept the Jewish people going for 2,000 years to some degree is not, isn't exactly the same. We're living in a time where we're, we're not on the road and many are re-entering ruins. And it's causing a lot of trouble sometimes when we enter ruins because we haven't been living in the ruins for 2,000 years. So we don't quite know what to do with it. Um, and we've been used to praying on the road. So how do you pray when you're no longer on the road? And how, what does your short prayer look like um, when you're no longer um, in the same conditions? So um, if this is the manifesto of, of uh, the Judaism of exile, right now we're in this incredible period in Judaism where we're re-examining that. We're trying to figure out, well, what does that mean? So when you come to my session on Israel, I'll be talking a lot more about that. But this is, this is probably my most favorite piece of Talmud because of how it brings together that past and that present. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing that. Um, and now um, we're going to go back to the PowerPoint and we're going to be doing a little bit more. Sorry, that's the wrong one. And we're going to be doing a little bit more of study together. Um, so now we're going to be studying together one of the great, one, to give you an example of how different what the rabbis were doing, um, how different what they were doing ended up becoming, because they were really taking the Bible and doing something 
quite different with it. And mainly because the Bible had been written a long time before and didn't fit the more urban, the more cosmopolitan um, um, ethics and morals had evolved quite a bit. You know, they weren't an agricultural society anymore. It was all very different. Um, and, you know, the value of life was very different already 2000 years ago than 3000 years ago. And um, the Torah might have been revolutionary when it came out, but parts of it were, you know, not quite as revolutionary a thousand five hundred years later. So um, this is um, an example of how things changed. Um, one of the most famous examples, conservative rabbis tend to love this. Um, um, it's a little bit of a dour example. I like other examples better, but this is what we got on this PowerPoint. So this is what we're doing. And I brought you the piece of Talmud that I love. So this is the piece of Talmud that some of my colleagues love, though it's still very interesting. Um, uh, Yochanan, do you mind reading this passage from the Torah? Yes. If a man has a stubborn and rebellious son, Ben Sogei Omogei, who does not obey his father and mother and will not listen to them, they discipline him. His father and mother shall take hold of him and bring him to the elders at the gate of his town. They shall say to the elders, This son of ours is wayward and defiant. He will not obey us. He is a glutton and a drunkard. Then all the men of his town shall stone him to death. You must purge the evil from among you. All Israel will hear and be afraid. Lovely, right? What do you think of it? Bit over the top. <laughs> you know, it's uh, it makes one think back to one's teenage years, and you're like, a good thing I didn't live in biblical times, right? Um, um, so, and this is in the Torah, right? So this is part of uh, what maybe in the Torah times, you know, if you're trying to think about it, you know, there were, you know, the, they live in a very chaotic time and they were trying to bring with a heavy hand some order to a very primitive society. Um, but this is, this is what they had. So then the Mishnah comes, right, the year 200, and is like, well, what do we do about this? Um, would somebody like to read what they say about it? Susan, do you mind reading for us again? The stubborn and rebellious son, when does he enter into the category of stubborn and rebellious? When two hairs appear on his beard until the time it fills in. This is speaking of the lower beard, but the sages use euphemistic language. I'm sorry, I can't see this. Uh, um, you, should, you can move your, your, your bar um, oh, can to the top. Yeah, you can, if you click on your bar, you can move it. Your zoom bar, you can move it somewhere else, yeah. As it is written, when a man has a son, therefore we learn, a son and not a daughter, a son and not yet a man. A minor is totally exempt since he does not yet have any liabilities. Should I continue? Okay. Um, so up until now, how have they limited the liability? Right? It's, they said it's from when the two hairs appear to when it fills in. So that's already limiting the time, right? Um, of how, when this law could even apply to you. You know, the, they're, legis they're legislating it out of existence. That's what they're doing. Um, and they're, the, the, the rabbis had no, they, they used euphemistic language, but they talked about everything. So they weren't talking about the beard <laughs> to give you. So um, then number two, Susan, do you mind reading number two? At what point is he considered liable? From when he eats a tartamar of meat and drinks a half log of wine. Rabbi Yossi says, it must be a manna of meat and a full log of wine. If he eats it at a gathering for a mitzvah, mitzvah or for a new moon meal, or as part of his tithes in Jerusalem, or he eats non-kosher food or foods that were improperly tithed, or eats anything that is a mitzvah to eat or anything that it's a sin to eat, none of this counts. If he eats any food other than meat or drinks any beverage other than wine, he isn't liable. This is based on the verse, he is a glutton and a drunkard. There is a scriptural hint that these words refer to meat and wine, which comes from the book of Proverbs. Do not be among the wine drinkers or the gluttonous meat eaters. Hmm. Interesting, right? So they're, you know, these are huge amounts, right? So they're saying, well, they're, they would never say the Torah is wrong, right? But they're saying, you know, Let's, 
What does it mean to be a glutton? Like at what point are we going to allow this to happen? To be a glutton and a drunkard, it's going to have to drink and eat a whole bunch. And you're going to have to be a certain age, which is very small. And it's going to have to, it's not going to be if you go to a, you know, a celebration because that's, we believe in celebration. So it'd have to be, and it can be, so they're really trying to, they're taking it out, they're legislating out of existence. So then we have a different Mishnah, which goes even further. Um, Charles, can you see, can you, do you mind reading? Let me see, do I, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, yeah. All right. If he steals money from his father and eats the food in his father's house, he is exempt. If he steals the money from others and eats with others, he is exempt. If he steals from others and eats in his father's house, he is exempt. It is only when he steals from his father and eats with others that he might be liable. Rabbi Yose Bar Yehuda says, he must steal from both his mother and his father to be liable. Hmm. Shall I continue so, or? Please, yeah, please continue, yeah. Number four? Yeah. If his father denounces him, but his mother disagrees, he's not liable. If his mother denounces him, but his father disagrees, he's not liable. They must agree together. Rabbi Yehuda says, if his mother isn't fitting for his father, then he is not liable. If one of the parents is blind or deaf or mute or in any way at all disabled, he is not liable. They must first bring him to a court of three where he will be punished. Then he must do the sin again. And this time he must be judged by a court of 23, including the original three judges. If at any point he runs away and doesn't return until he is a legally a man is exempt however if he was judged guilty and then runs away if he, before he can be executed he's still executed on his return so we're they're they're really um going even further with this right you know it's uh, talking about all the difference of you know the father agrees and the mother doesn't and you know it's not the way we talk about people with disabilities but in their mind people with disabilities um, were didn't have, you know, 2000 years ago, they didn't understand them. So they didn't give them, um, their voice did not count logically. So they're, they're just using all these different ways to close down even the potential that this could ever happen, right? Um, well, but if the mother and father don't agree, there's no, it says originally that they're both uh, have to bring the son. And if you kill somebody, one of the parents is disabled you're putting all sorts of burdens on the the other parent who is not or blind so to me that would make a little bit of sense that you might want to limit it some way to it consider makes the good, circumstances and, the, and it makes good sense if you're going to kill someone for this reason you'd want to have you know all these different people and you want them to have done it twice and that you know you this makes good sense to us right this is not we would agree with this kind of thinking um, and then it continues. Uh, Maggie, do you mind reading um, this next bit? What does it mean that his mother is not fitting for his father? It might mean that the relationship is improper. However, at the end of the day, his parents are still his parents. So this probably isn't so. Rather, it must mean that his mother must be physically or similar to her husband. Why? Because the Torah says, he doesn't pay attention to her voice. From this, we learn that they must have smaller voices, and it logically follows that they must have the same physical stature. There is a teaching. There never was and never will be a true Ben Zor Why then is it written at all? It must be simply so that you can study it and in, doing, and in so doing can gain reward. Whose opinions does this teaching follow? It might be Rabbi Yudina, who requires that the parents look and speak similarly, which is basically impossible. It might also be Rabbi who taught this. Just because a boy ate meat and drank wine, his parents will never take him out and stoned. But Rabbi Yudina said, I once saw a stubborn, rebellious son, and I even sat on his side. Well, this is a pretty typical um, piece of Talmud, right? It's like, 
and the, and the Talmud doesn't tell you who it goes with, but it leaves it all open. But it leaves you, it gives you a sense by going with its flow. You know what? We don't, we do not stone people, you know, rebellious sons um, or daughters. In, um, so, um, and, and, and as you see, you can see that they're trying to be respectful to the rabbinic, to the Torah text, but they're also having a little bit of fun with it, right? And they're, they're I mean, they're very serious, but they're, they're applying that mind, that quality of let's interpret it and analyze every little bit of it um, and then come to, to an understanding that fits our time. And what they're doing is really important, right? They're, 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 they're letting religion evolve, really, which is incredibly important. And, um, you know, I, I remember um, once studying, um, going, doing a, a week-long retreat with uh, Christian and Muslim clergy, and we were talking about each other's problematic texts. And, you know, so different religions brought a problematic text. And one of the texts that, that we brought as Jews was a passage from the Torah where it says, you know, where Jews are commanded to kill this whole people and everything. And then the people, I mean, the people who brought it were, were, were not Jewish. And I said, you know, we have plenty of problematic texts, but this is not really a problematic text because we've put comments and legislated this whole piece of out of existence for so long, we're so far removed from the problematic nature of this text because we have so many commentaries which has taken us so far away from its original meaning. And it's one of the, one of the, the, the nice things about the Talmudic approach is that it makes the oral law, the law that keeps moving and expanding um, the, the, the most vital and dynamic part of it. And we keep the written text because we find it powerful and beautiful and depending where you are in the Jewish stream, we believe it comes directly word for word, letter, letter from God, which means it has that power um, and timelessness. Or others might feel it's inspired by God or it's but whatever you believe, we believe the Torah has that power to it. But without the Talmud, we'd still be stoning people, which we don't wanna be doing. Um, so the Talmud is giving us, um, so we're not gonna do this last story, um, but, um, I think uh, maybe to conclude that um, the way I understand best um, and the way I like to talk about um, the Talmud is, again, going back to this idea that the biblical times were this powerful time, this mythical time where people talked to God, where there was a sense of incredible vitality. And really, the, you know, the biblical Judaism is one of the foundations of Western civilization, right? Several billion people worldwide came out of what the small people in Israel created, the Bible, and that Western, that basis of Western civilization. I mean, that's how powerful this small people in this little corner of the Near East were and what they did. They, they were able to um, create a culture, a set of values and morals, that was incredibly powerful. It's also the basis of Christianity. Um, and then after that period came to an end, um, because it, could no long, it was just the world had moved on, um, Jews um, went in a different direction. And that different direction was equally rich and beautiful and created a, an intellectual culture, a culture based on community, a culture based on analysis and questions and always and of loving kindness. You know, when you're a minority, then um, often you know what it's like to feel the brunt of other people's power. So you make a lot of laws and you think a lot about power and how power hurts people who are in positions of powerlessness. Um, so Jews really cre um, went in a completely different direction for 2000 years um, and created a very beautiful, rich set of practices and rituals that can be done anywhere. And when you when you're being thrown out of one country and going to another, you can always take your practices with you. You can take your intellectual life with you. You can take your home practices. So we, you can't take a big shiny temple with you, but you can take other things with you. Um, so we we learn to adapt, and um, um, a lot of beauty has come out of it. And then, as I was talking about a little while ago, now we're in this tremendous time. And when I became a rabbi and um, I applied to rabbinical school and the rabbinical school asked me, well, why do you want to become a rabbi? And I said to them, because I believe we're living in an unprecedented time for Jews right now. We're living at a time 
where after 2000 years of exile, we have a diaspora in the United States that's not threatened, almost not threatened, but that's thriving. And we have, we're back in our Jewish homeland, we're back in the ruins. So we're at a time where we can almost bring back that power of the Bible without the stoning and the animal sacrifices, but some of that not feeling under threat, um, some of that not being on the road, some of that feeling secure, but at the same time with the wisdom of what we learned from 2000 years on the road. So I think we're an incredibly rich time um, for Judaism and it all comes out of this. Any thoughts, questions, comments? Questions? Thank you for this explanation that uh, was something I never understood before. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for thank you for coming. Nice to see you all. And um, I will see you all soon. And happy Purim. I hope you can join us for our Purim celebration on Thursday night. You're all invited. It's going to be a lot of fun. And if you'd like to record the joke and send it in to us, we, we might just play it. And we're going to do a competition. Best joke is going to win a gift card of some kind. Have a nice day. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you.